Hey there! Welcome to my review of the 1980 comedy, Seems Like Old Times. Um, I actually, I didn't watch this on this VHS. I actually watched it on, on demand. One night, my mom and I were just hanging out and decided to watch something on demand. And mom found it seems like old times. And she put it on and she fell asleep. But I finished the movie. <laughs> um, the movie's not that bad, but it's not really what I call a great film. I'd call it just a meh, okay, mediocre, decent comedy, but it's watchable. But it, it's not nothing that's really that great. Um, the film it was this it was the second uh, collaboration between Goldie Hawn and Chevy Chase. This is right after their big success of the movie Foul Play. This made forty three million in the box office, so it made money, but it wasn't as big of a hit as Foul Play and. They never really reunited again. Um, the film was directed by Jay Sandrich. Well, I thought for the longest time it was Sandwich. I was like, not bad for a film directed by a sandwich. But it's Sandrich, not Sandwich. And it's written by Neil Simon. And Neil Simon, for the longest time, is a writer that I always thought was the same guy as Paul Simon. I don't know what it was. Like, even as a kid, I'm like, oh, Paul, so Paul Simon, uh, the singer, the singer-songwriter wrote this movie. And he writes plays, too? Wow, what a really great guy. He's very multi-talented. No, no, he's not. <laughs> Paul Simon is a, just a singer-songwriter, and Neil Simon is the writer guy. But, you know, you can't, you can't, they have the same last name, so... Um, but anyway, uh, I guess Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney actually wrote and recorded an, an unused song as a title track for this movie. And uh, Marsha Mason and Burt Reynolds were actually touted as the leads in this movie, according to the film's early publicity. But then these, then they were, either they turned it down or they didn't, didn't end up going with them. And so these roles were eventually cast with Goldie Hawn and Chevy Chase. And this is the... One of the first uh, Neil Simon movies that was not written direct was not based on a Neil Simon play. It was written directly for the screen and only for the screen. Um, the film had a two-week rehearsal period in which, during the during the the time period, writer Neil Simon customized a screenplay that tailored the lead star's personalities. I think he did a pretty good, solid job with that. Um, the movie is watchable and, and a decent bit of entertainment because of its cast. And uh, the film does a good job utilizing them. Uh, the picture represented the second and final teaming of actors Goldie Hawn and Chevy Chase. And the theatrical field, the, it was the theatrical film debut of TV director Jay Sandrich. And this movie was the first of two Neil Simon works that Sandrich would direct. Sandrich would then go on to later helm Neil Simon's London Suite, a 1996 TV movie for television, which I've never seen. Now... The basic gist of the plot is this. You have a character named Nick Gardenia who's played by Chevy Chase. He's an out-of-luck writer, and he has the use of his friend's Big Sur, California, Oceanside cabin. He is then interrupted by a pair of bank robbers, Warren Dex Dexter, played by Judd Oman, and B.J. Ramone, played by Mark Alameo, who use Nick to rob a bank in Carmel. Their modus operandi is to take an innocent person and force them at gunpoint to rob banks, take the money, and then toss their captive out of their moving car. Unfortunately for Nick, as in one of Chevy Chase's signature pratfalls, he trips in the bank and then is helped up and looks directly into a security camera. And the camera gets his picture. And it's not a candid camera. It's the real thing. And Chevy Chase is, is pretty solid in this. I wouldn't say it's one of my favorites of his. Um, but he does. there are some moments that, that, that he has in the film that made me laugh. He, he is a great physical comedian. He showed that a lot in SNL with his with the pratfalls and trips and so forth. Definitely to put his body on the line, so to speak, for our amusement. Well, the bank's picture of Nick then comes to the attention of Los Angeles District Attorney Ira Parks, played by Charles Grodin, and when his assistant Fred, played by Robert Guglielmi, recognizes it to be Parks' wife's ex-husband. And because of his desire to become State Attorney General, Ira is frustrated and upset, thinking this could harm his campaign. And it was a good casting choice to get Charles Grodin to play this role because nobody plays a stuck-up asshole better than Charles Grodin. Ira's wife, Glenda, played by Goldie Hawn, is a lawyer herself. A public defender, Glenda often tries to re rehabilitate her clients by giving them odd jobs around their house, as with her chauffeur-slash-butler Chester, played by T.K. Carter, Knowles from The Thing, 
which was nice to see T.K. Carter in a different film. Um, there's a fun scene where he's he, he, he He's asked to chase a police car, and he's like, "Oh man, it's not every day you get to chase the police." <laughs> or someone else is like, "Ah, I, this is this is cool. I get to chase the police this time around." <laughs> and after a long day in court, Glenda then comes home to mixed news. Joy for Ira running for attorney general, and surprise, and Ira gives her news about Nick. She wants to defend Nick because of her disbelief that he would ever do such a thing. The robbers then ditch Nick, and he desperately makes his way to Glenda. And and Ira's Brentwood Los Angeles house. On his way there, he ends up, he stops at this gas station, and he, he puts a gunpoint, this guy, he's, he's telling him, I, I want, uh, put some gas in the car, and give me some milk duds. And there's a put some gas in the car, and then he goes in, and he's going to the, he went to the vending, goes to the vending machine, he's trying to get some milk duds, but it takes his money, so it's not doing anything, so he gets the guy, he put it, he put it, points, it gets the guy at gunpoint, and I was all like, this thing doesn't work. Give me my milk duds. I want some milk duds. It's like, oh, we don't have any milk duds. You want a Clark bar? Okay. All right. And then he eats the candy. He's like, it's candy. It's stale. <laughs> but then, I, I thought it was just, Chevy Chase, is, is, his line delivery was pretty funny. And in that scene, it was like, you would what are you doing? Keeping stale candy? Selling stale candy? Um, and a, he, he, he also got a Clark bar, which is a kind of, and probably an unintentional uh, reference to his later role as Clark Griswold in the National Lampoon's Vacation films. Um, by, by unintentional, I mean this is probably not an intentional reference, but it was just, they just thought Clark bar was, I guess, something they thought uh, Chevy Chase would like. Or they thought it was funny. So then um, he ends, he gets to uh, their house. And then during a party, Glenda, while searching for one of her dogs, which is a bunch of them, including one, a St. Bernard, which was interesting, I thought. Because, see, there's a St. Bernard right here. And Charles Grodin was in a film where he had a pet St. Bernard before Beethoven, which I thought was kind of interesting. And so... She's trying to find one of her dogs, and she ends up finding Nick hiding in her garage. Nick then begs for help, and she tries to get him some food, despite most of the leaders of law enforcement being in her house. And she tries to get him some food, but she ends up giving the food to the cops. And then Nick explains what happened, but Glenda refuses to help unless he turns himself in. Glenda finally agrees to let him sleep in the guest room over the garage. And then the next day, Nick decides he wants to personally go after the guys who did this to him. And after some comically close run-ins with the police, with Ira and with a feisty maid, played by Aurora De La Hoya, played by, the character's name was Aurora De La Hoya, and her, the actress's name is Yvonne Wilder. I thought she did a good job. She manages to keep anyone from knowing Nick was there. He later then robs her of her car, but then it reappears over her garage, and another competition ensues between Ira and Glenda. And then Ira then soon discovers that Nick was telling the truth about the two men who forced him to rob the bank. About to have the governor of California coming to the house for dinner, Glenda must deal with the court cases and with her maid having foot surgery. She's having her foot scraped, which would could ruin the party without the governor's favorite dish, Aurora's famous chicken pepperoni. And with Chester getting drunk in the kitchen, which that doesn't help at all, so then the party then takes a hilarious turn when Nick coming back to turn himself in ends up serving dinner to the governor, Ira, Glenda, and Fred. And I like the re reaction that that um, Robert Guglielmi has. He sees that Nick is there, and he knows the governor's there. And so he sees Nick as the butler, and he's like, holy shit! Um, excuse me, governor. Uh... <laughs> He, he censored himself because the governor was there. He's pointing at it. He's like, Nick's there. And so, they, um, so Nick is serving dinner to them. And then the dinner ultimately ends in a fist fight between a jealous Ira and Nick, during which Fred is knocked out. And then Nick, Glenda, Ira, and Aurora, and the dogs and the robbers eventually all end up in the courtroom of Glenda's favorite judge, Ch John Channing, played by Harold Gould which is pretty convenient, and then while the judge is then overwhelmed by the happenings in the Parks house, so the police bring in the bank robbers. They admit, admit Nick's innocence in exchange for a reduced sentence by getting caught after getting caught by Aurora, and then the dogs, when they attempted to force her to rob a bank, they, yeah, they tried, they, yeah, they tried to, um, 
the bank robbers tried to do something with Aurora, so they got caught by her, though, and the dogs when they attempted to free, force her to rob a bank, which is like they did Nick. And so they admit Nick's innocence in exchange for a reduced sentence. And then after all said and done, Nick is free, but he and Glenda still have unresolved feelings. She then decides to stay with Ira and kisses Nick goodbye. And then sometime later, Ira and Glenda decide to take a car trip to forget recent events. And then they end up in an accident trying to avoid a cow. And then Ira breaks his leg. So then Glenda has to go for help. And then she ends up at the only place around. What do you think it is? A cabin with lights on, which happens to be Nick's cabin. She pounds on the door for help. She discovers Nick's cabin. She smiles. Freeze frame. That's the movie. It's a film that I thought was meh. It was okay. It was decent. It wasn't anything I would say is a great comedy. I wouldn't say it's a classic. I think the rating on IMDb is a bit too high for a film like this. It's a film that, you know, obviously wasn't engaging enough because my mom fell asleep watching it. But uh, you could do worse than this film. But um, before I give you my rating, I just want to talk about some pros and cons that I that I recognize from the movie. Um, some pros are there's is that it has an excellent cast. I mean. Chevy Chase, Goldie Hawn, Charles Grodin, Robert Giuliani, and they have a great back and forth, especially between the two leads, Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn. They definitely have a lot of chemistry with one another. Some witty writing um, by Neil Simon, some really fun lines. Um, I like this line where Chevy Chase is talking about the Mexican jail that he was in for a couple years because he he sat on some drugs and so somehow it got in in, in his in his pants or something and so he got caught for smuggling drugs and so he was talking about the Mexican jail I was in was so bad that two cockroaches in the cell with me committed suicide <laughs> I love that the jail was so terrible that the cockroaches in the cell with him committed suicide and then I thought I had it part part of the plot was kind of interesting um Goldie's ex gets involved with a bank robbery and then he ends up on the run and then he hides out at her place and they just keep showing up in her life just like it was the old times. Seems like old times. And then it makes for some really great setups for laughs. Especially the scene where Charles Grodin and Gold is up in the guest the the is in the um the room above the garage where Nick was hiding. And th this is the and Goldie goes up there and sees he's not there, so she's thinking Nick isn't there. But the joke is that Nick's still in the room, he's underneath the bed, and so Goldie Hahn and Charles Grodin are trying to get it on in the bed, and and she, she's also trying not to. Actually, that happens later, but she, they're just in the room, and she's trying to tell Charles Grodin that Nick's not there, and and Nick actually is there. It's hard to explain without actually showing the scene. Uh, some good physical comedy by Chevy Chase. He just has his hands out from underneath the bed, and Charles Grodin's stepping on him, and Chevy Chase has his try not to scream. So. Def there are definitely some moments in it that I thought were pretty fun. Um, but it wasn't a film that I thought was laugh out loud hilarious. But there are some good setups for laughs. Um, so those are some prawns. Some, those are prawns. They're not prawns. It's not shrimp. The, those are some pros. And he, uh, here's some cons for the film. I think it's definitely a film of its time. It definitely does feel dated nowadays. It doesn't really have that timeless feel that a lot of classic comedies do. And for me, it was a little bit too old-fashioned. Uh, the plot isn't really that engaging or interesting. Like I was saying, you have the whole interesting sort of premise, but the plot, but it's not as engaging. Uh, it's an interesting premise. Like I said, I'm kind of contradicting myself. It's not really engaging or interesting, but it kind of is. But the whole thing, the whole plot isn't. It's just that one part is pretty. I thought was kind of in, interesting. A good setup for for laughs. And what keeps it afloat is the cast and some funny jokes here and there, but there, there's not a lot of them that are really going to stick with you and are really memorable. Um, I thought the musical score was horrendous. The score by Mar Marvin Hamlish is a terrible score. It does not fit the film at all. It sounds like the soundtrack for a 70s porno. It doesn't sound like the soundtrack that, we, that you would use for a comedy for the year 1980. And the soundtrack itself just sounds dated. It really dates the film. And the ending to me, it made no sense. See, it end. I thought it end. It was it. It. I thought the movie ended when Chevy Chase is allowed to give a kiss goodbye to his ex, despite the displeasure of Charles Grodin. 
and his disagreements. But then after that, then they get into Charles Grodin and Goldie Hawn, get, into, get in the car, drive away, hit a fucking cow. Then they <laughs> Charles Grodin breaks his leg. And then Goldie Hawn goes in, tries to find help, runs into Nick, knocks on the door, sees him. She smiles, freeze frames. And I'm like, okay, she's so going to cheat on her husband now? I, I guess she never really wanted to be with Ira. She always wanted to be with Chevy Chase. She always wanted to be with Nick. It felt like it was the beginning of a sequel. After the moment where Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn share a kiss outside the court courtroom, that's where the movie should have ended. It doesn't make any sense for it to go any further after that. It just feels tacked on, and it does, and it really hurts. It makes it feel like the movie doesn't even end. It just feels like it just abruptly stops because it started another whole part of the film, another plot line, and then it just ends it right then and there. But anyway, those are my pros, those are my cons, and I really don't know what else to say about the film other than if it was a rated out of five stars. Like I said, it's okay comedy, that's why I give it three stars. I give it a three, star, three out of five star rating, it's decent, I'll keep it for my collection, um, but I've definitely seen funnier comedies than this, but it would, it, you know, I wasn't expecting much, so it was at least entertaining enough, I'd say it's probably a time waster for me. But anyway, I really don't know what else to say about it seems like old times, except thank you for watching my review, and I will see you guys later. See ya.